Daniel Mesa, I have been serving the Lord since 1996, and I have been so blessed in all the things God has taught me in His Word. My life has changed. I have been completely transformed by the Word of God. I was a heavy metal drummer for many years. I was into drugs. I was into drinking. I was into the women and doing all those things that come with that lifestyle. But when I started reading God's Word, it transformed my life. And so being a pastor since the year 2000, ordained in 2005, I was able to study and pray and preach and teach and share the Word of God all over the world. Since being a pastor in a church, I've been able to travel even farther. And it's been such an amazing experience to be able to share God's Word with so many people and see lives transformed. And so what I'm going to do today is share with you 50 Bible questions about the Trinity that I've come up with in my study, in my research, in my digging into God's Word to try to find what does the Bible say about the Trinity, if anything at all. And so I'm going to go ahead and go through these questions. You're going to be looking at my screen and we are going to be able to see and understand together some of the things that the Bible does and doesn't say. I've already asked God's blessings on this activity and I pray that you will do the same thing. So let's look at what the Bible says about the Trinity. Here are 50 Bible questions about the Trinity. I'm going to scroll down and go to page two here. Where are the words Trinity, Triune, Triunity, or the like in the Bible? Okay, they don't exist. You're going to go ahead and see Trinity. I'm going to search it here in my Bible program, and it's going to say that the Bible program doesn't find the word Trinity. The book Trinity cannot be found. And so I'm going to actually scroll out and see that I'm not looking for the book Trinity. I'm looking for the words. And so I'm going to search that and it's going to say, now, are you looking for the word triumph or triumphed, triumphing, troas, trodden? Nope. I'm looking for the word Trinity, but guess what? It doesn't exist. And so when we're looking for the words Trinity, triunity, uh, all those different types of terms, we don't find them in the Bible. Not in the King James Version, which is the one I use. Now, I do use other versions, but certainly that's the one I'm going to be using today and trying to find out some of the answers to the questions that we have. So now the Bible goes on, or questions about the Bible goes on. Can we find God the Son in the Bible? Really good question. And so I'm going to go again to my program here. I'm going to close this tab and I've already set it up to search for God the Son. Now, I'm not looking for verses, I'm looking for words. And so I'm going to look for God the Son. Now, it's actually asking a question. The phrase you entered cannot be found. Would you like to search with flex search? You've got to understand flex search is using different words other than what you were using. And so I'm going to say no. And the reality is you can't find God the Son. So now I'm going to go and find God the Spirit. Okay, because God the Spirit is another question that I've got right here. Number three, can God the Spirit be found in the Bible? So searching for that phrase, a book name must be entered at the selection point. No, I don't want a book name. I want words. And so I'm going to search for it and it cannot be found. Same exact wording. It says the phrase you entered cannot be found. Would you like to search with flex search? The answer is no, I do not want to. And so the next question that we have is where are the terms co-eternal or co-equal in the Bible? That's questions four and five. So I'm going to go and try to search for the words again, co-eternal. And it's asking, do you want to find the word coffer or coffin, cogitations, cold, and some other names there? But nope, I'm looking specifically for the word co-eternal, but it doesn't, it doesn't occur. It doesn't exist. And so again, I'm going to change this idea here. I want words co-eternal. When I hit enter, it's going to give me the same thing again. Do you want coffer? coffin, cogitations, cold. No, I don't. I'm looking for those exact phrases. But the reality is those exact phrases don't exist in the Bible. So here's another question that I've got to ask. If the salient words or phrases of the Trinity are not found in the Bible, where does this idea come from? All historians would understand if you're looking for the word Trinity and the idea of three gods in one or one God in three persons, you're going to find in 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea, there was a group of people 
that found that they were not agreeing in theological terms. And so what happened is they came to the point where there was actually wars and killing and deceit and all sorts of things. They were taking men away from their pastorates or their priesthood, and they were putting in other people that they felt, even though they didn't have godly lives, were fulfilling the theology they thought was better with the Trinity. And so if we go and find from the Bible the terms that we can use, we will have a better ability to describe what God has given us to understand about himself. And that's what we're going to try to do in this study. Now, I want to show you something. If you're interested in the history of Nicaea, you can find at a website that I have, revelationwithdaniel.com. You can see the link there if I zoom it in a little bit. Revelationwithdaniel.com. Okay, so you're going to be able to go to resources and books. If you click on books, you'll be able to find several different books. And one of which I'm going to scroll down to is The Formulation of the Doctrine of the Trinity by Linford Beachy, a good Christian brother. It's a history of the formulation of the doctrine of the Trinity within Orthodox Christianity. You're going to want to find that book, click it, read the PDF. It is absolutely free, and I believe you'll be blessed. So that history will help us understand a little bit more of what's going on with how it came into the church, how it was promulgated, and how it was spread abroad throughout the entire world. And so some of that history is pretty interesting. In fact, I won't go into it now. Perhaps in the future we'll get into some of that history. What we can find now is in an Old Testament prophecy of Jesus Christ in the Bible, when it refers to the Council of Peace, which is between them both, who are the both? If it was God the Father and His Son, where was the Spirit? A really good question. That verse, by the way, is Zechariah chapter 6, verse 13. I'm going to go ahead and find it with you. If we go to the Bible and we find Zechariah 6, 13, it says that he shall be a priest upon his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. That's the council of the Father and his Son. That's both of them, the Father and and the Son. Because remember, God gave His only begotten Son. And so when God gave His Son for us, we've got to understand that He sent His Son into the world. Now, we're going to continue on with some of these ideas, but the Council of Peace was between the Father and the Son. And so when we're looking at this idea of what the Bible teaches in regard to the Old Testament and the Council of Peace between them both, we must ask the question, where was the Spirit? Now, we should understand that the Spirit is the Spirit of God. Now, the word of is possessive. So, if I said the Spirit of Daniel, I would be talking about my spirit. So, if I'm talking about the Spirit of God, I need to understand that it is God's Spirit. Now, if God is three in one, then it's the Spirit of three in one. But we've got to decipher, is that really what the Bible is teaching? Can we find a phrase three in one or one in three in the Bible? Do your search on your own time. You won't find it. And I have done all this study. I've come to a realization that we're using terms to try to describe God in a way that he does not describe himself. And so I'm trying to stay away from those terms and use the things that help me understand how God has described himself. So now... Let's go to our next question here in Numbers uh, number 8. If Proverbs 8 verses 22 through 30 relates to wisdom as being brought forth and as one brought up with God, and then the prophet Paul in the New Testament refers to Christ as wisdom in Corinthians 1, 24 and 30, is this what we have as prophets inspired authority to make that connection? I think, of course, the answer is yes. I'm going to go ahead and search this phrase here. And 1 Corinthians 1, 24, comma, 30. We're going to be able to read, Unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God, and, in addition to the power of God, he is the wisdom of God. So just a few verses later, Of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is, is made unto us wisdom and righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. And so we have here in the Bible a very clear, prophetic-inspired use of Christ being wisdom. 
Well, there's another prophet in the Bible that was Solomon in Proverbs 8 that used Christ, or rather the word wisdom, as one that was brought forth from the Lord. And so I like to think, as the Bible describes in so many other places, that wisdom is referring to Christ, which was brought forth from the Lord, which is the Father, way back in the beginning. So that seems to me as being the furthest time in history that you can go back. I find that really interesting. So let's go ahead and find uh, question number nine. Who is the Most High? We can find out from a demon if we look at Mark 5 verse 7. Mark 5 verse 7. And the demon cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. So we need to understand that this phrase here, um, son of the most high God, was actually spoken by a demon. So he didn't call out saying, I know who you are. You are God and you have come in the flesh. You're trying to pose as the son of God, but I know that you're not. No. See, the demon could have said that and could have completely destroyed Christ's persona or his false persona. But Christ wasn't playing games. Christ was claiming to be the Son of God. And as a result, the demons were able to cry out, We know who you are. What's fascinating is James chapter 2 actually describes also that uh, Jesus is the Son of the one true God. So what does it say? James chapter 2 and verse 19, the Bible says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and they tremble. Now, so if the devils believe that there's one God, who do you suppose, according to the Bible, the devil believes Jesus is? You just read it earlier in Mark chapter 5. He is the son of the most high God. You see, demons know that there's one God, and that one God has a son. That is incredible. And so I love the idea of how the Bible describes so many beautiful things to us using basic human language. Now, that doesn't make God human, not at all. God is divine. God has a divine son. But God has an actual divine son. And so we have been given terms like begotten, or brought forth and these terms of son of God and God the Father for the purposes of understanding the relationship between the Father and his son. If you go to that same website, Revelation with Daniel, you can find that I have a set of notes. If you go and just search for the term 307, I'm going to go ahead and make that bigger there so you can see I'm searching for 307. If you hit enter, you will find 307 verses about the Father and the Son. You can click that right there and will take you to a set of verses. Lots of verses, Bible verses that go on and on and on. 307 of them telling us about the Father and His Son. And so feel free to search that website. You'll find lots of good information about what the Bible says and also what it doesn't say. So feel free to ask questions as well. Go to the contact and send me an information or some information that you found. Uh, please help. I have lots of people sending me books and videos, especially now videos with this like power grab around the world where the nations are trying to come together to force everybody into submission because of fear and these types of things. No, I have people sending me books, not books necessarily, but videos after video after video. I can't watch them all. I have emails coming in and phone calls and all sorts of stuff. I, it's very hard to keep up with everything. So if you do have information, do me the favor of believing that I can think. I do have the ability to think. Ask some questions, put a couple of Bible verses, a few bullet points, and make a conclusion. And I can come to the point where if it's really simple like that, I'll be like, whoa, you're right. I'm, I've, I, need, I need to check into this. So thank you so much for that opportunity so that uh, we aren't completely wiped out by each other's information going back and forth. I'm trying to make this one really short, and so that's what uh, I'm hoping you'll do for me as well. Notice it says in the 10th um, question, Lucifer wanted to be, notice, like the Most High, as it says in Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. So who is like the Most High? 
You can find out from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, who was the express image of God, the Most High. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. God, who at various times and in different manners, he spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. He hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So notice, God hath by his Son made the worlds. Okay. Who, the Son, being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So Jesus Christ is the one who is like the Most High. And Satan, if you go to Isaiah 14, verses 12 and onward, you'll find that means that Lucifer wanted to be like Jesus, or the Son of God. Jesus really didn't take on that name until he took on flesh. So sometimes I say Jesus for the Christ or the, the anointed, because Christ means anointed, so he wasn't just anointed at his baptism. He was anointed by the Father as well. You can see that in Hebrews. You can see that in uh, Psalm chapter 2. He was appointed as the Son. He was appointed as the one on the throne. He was appointed as the Lord of hosts. He was appointed as the commander and ruler of all things under the Father. And so it's incredible to know that this Jesus Christ, the express image of his Father's person, was the one that was sent. So going back to the notes here, I want to see what it says. So Lucifer wanted to be like the Most High. Remember, Jesus is the one that's like the Most High. He's the son of the Most High. And so what was Lucifer trying to do? Lucifer, in his interest, was trying to be like the Most High because he could see there was a difference between the Father and the Son. He didn't want to be the Most High. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says he wanted to be like the Most High because as a created being, Lucifer could see there was the Father and there was his begotten Son. But you see, Lucifer as an angel was also a son. He was a son by creation. That's where we can read in the book of Job's that the sons of God shouted for joy, right? Those were the angels that were watching the creation of all things. N not of all things, excuse me, because they were created themselves. But of this earth, they were singing and uh, rejoicing, etc. And so what we can see is Lucifer was a son by creation. Christ, or the Son of God, was a son by being begotten. We, on the other hand, are sons by creation and also by being adopted into the family of God. We are the children of God. So Lucifer, being a son and looking at Christ as a son, he saw that that son was able to go into the councils between them both, but he wasn't able to go into those councils. And we also know that he wasn't worshipped, but the Son of the Most High was worshipped as the begotten Son, but the created Son wasn't worshipped. And you can read in Ezekiel 28 where the uh, king of Tyrus was actually illustrated as the uh, Lucifer, as the Son that was created. And so you can find that all these beautiful gems and jewels were upon Lucifer, and he had the ability to sing with the pipes that he had. And all of those wonderful tabrets that he had in, in his musical abilities, but he wasn't worshipped. And so what was happening is Lucifer wanted to have worship. And so that son had worship. He as a son didn't have worship. And so he wanted to be like the Most High. And if you study the book of Revelation, what you realize is the entire issue at the end of time is all about worship. In fact, in Revelation 13, verses 11 through 18, and also Daniel chapter 3, if you put those sections together in the Bible, you'll realize there are tons of connections between Daniel 3 and Revelation 13, the second beast there of 11, uh, verses 11 through 18. You put those ideas together and you realize that God is doing or showing to us what the enemy is trying to do at the end of time. He wants to gather everybody in the world. That's what this whole crisis thing is about. It's fulfilling the type of the antitype of Daniel chapter 3 for the end of time. Because Revelation 13 is still future, but you can see what happened in the past 
in this microcosm story of Daniel 3, which illustrates the big picture of Revelation 13, verses 11 through 18. And so what, what's, what we're seeing right now in the world is everybody's being gathered together so that they will not just come together and be vaccinated. No, that's not the issue. The whole issue is that they will worship the false god of Satan. Now, Satan couldn't be the third being in the councils between them both. And so he wanted to set up something on the earth so that he can be counted as the third being in the councils of them three, not of them both, you see. So there is an unholy trio or an unholy trinity here on this earth that is actually making Satan as one of the beings that is being worshipped. And I say, no, that is idolatry and it needs to be turned away from, it needs to be rejected. And so what we're seeing according to the Bible is that the, the Trinity idea is not something found in the Bible. These words are not even expressed. So let's go to question number 11 and we're gonna find that why Lucifer was envious of the Son of God and he was not of the Father is what I had just explained. Was there a difference? The answer is yes. You can actually see that in John 14, 28. If you go to John 14, 28, you realize that Jesus said, I go unto the Father. And then he says, for my Father is greater than I. Now, if you do yourself the favor of searching that word greater, what I'm going to do is make this bigger again. I'm going to right click. I'm going to search for a key whoops i'm going to search for a key number that is the greek key number i'm going to search for that and find out that it actually occurs you'll see 45 different times and what happens is this greek word is greater and greater greater greatest 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 and greater 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 and when you go all the way down to romans chapter uh, what is it 11 i think it is no romans chapter 9 you realize that the word greater actually is translated one time as elder. Do you know that Jesus inspired by his spirit? You can read that in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 10 and 11. It was the spirit of Christ inspiring the prophets. You realize that the spirit of Christ actually inspired Paul to use this word greater as elder as he was writing to the Romans in Romans chapter 9 verse 12. And so that to me is amazing because what we have Jesus saying in John chapter 14 verse 28 is that his father was older than him. Not only that, but his father is greater than him, I believe also in person. You see, there's lots of amazing things you can learn about God as you start to study the Bible. And some of the things is height. I'm not going to get into the details of that, but uh, you'll find that that's pretty interesting once you go and study it. So I'm going to go back to our question now. And number 12, what is an example or reference in the Bible where it says it is metaphorical, symbolic, an illustration, or to be understood as an analogy that God is his son's actual father? And so... This relationship between the father and the son is not metaphorical. It is not symbolic or an illustration. All those 307 Bible verses that illustrate the relationship between the father and his son that I showed you earlier on the Revelation with Daniel website, none of them show the illustration as an analogy or as symbolic. It is 100% realistic. God is the father of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the son of God. And so notice number 13 here. If the Trinity is God the Spirit makes intercession for humans in Romans 8.26, because the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, how can Paul say that there is only one mediator between God and men? And we know that that's 1 Timothy 2.5. I'll go ahead and read it for you. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. For there is one God, according to Paul, teaching Timothy who he was preparing for the ministry, and there's only one mediator between God and men. So there's God, there's men, and there's one mediator. Who is that? The man, Christ Jesus. So after he became a man, he was installed, if you will, in the heavenly courts as a mediator between God and men. So 
there is only one mediator and that's why you have to ask the question like when he said that the spirit intercedes for us with groanings which cannot be uttered and there's only one mediator between god and man which is christ jesus how is it that we have more than one intercessor or mediator we don't it's it's very clear according to the bible if you read the context i'm going to go ahead and read uh revelation i'm sorry romans 8 34 and i've got to take that one thing out of there because it does that in my program i wish it wouldn't but who is he that condemneth it is christ that died yea rather that is risen again so christ who is even at the right hand of god who also maketh intercession for us so christ is the one making intercession for us and so the spirit here in verse 28 where um in verse 26 sorry when it says the spirit itself maketh intercession for us you have to ask the question what spirit is that i'm going to go ahead and break the rule a little bit here by going to four four through six now so when the fullness of time was come what did god do god sent forth his son now it was to redeem those that were under the law that we might receive the adoption to be sons or or children of God with his family after he sent his son right so then after he sent his son so that we can receive the adoption what happens is but that God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts crying Abba father so it's really the spirit of his son that God sent and that's why earlier in Galatians 2 verse 20 it says that we can be crucified with Christ nevertheless we live Yet we don't live, but Christ lives in us. Wait a minute. Christ lives in us? Who's this Christ? He is the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. So God's Son is living in us. Christ liveth in me. And that's why we can see here that it's Christ that is interceding, and it is Christ's Spirit as the intercessor in Romans 8.26, as the only one that is mediating between God and men. I hope that's helpful because that can be very tricky. If you're seeing that the Holy Spirit is an intercessor between you and God, and then Christ is the only mediator between you and God, you're wondering like, whoa, what's going on? I thought that it was Christ, but it's the Spirit. Now all of a sudden you have two intercessors, but the Bible doesn't teach there's two intercessors. The Bible teaches there's one. So we must understand what the Bible is saying and try to get away from the things that are false and dark and demonic. Trust me, the Trinity is not good. It's not okay. It is demonic. It is Satan posing as the Spirit of God, the third being in the counsels of them both, which is not something that God allowed. And so what we have there is this description of Satan trying to personate the Spirit being a something other than the Spirit of God, because God has a spirit, God has a son. And so it's God and his son with the spirit of God in and through his son. The only way we can come to the father is through Christ Jesus. And so what we see in these questions here is more of the same. It says in number 14, how many ways are there to the father? John 14 verse six, we'll go ahead and read it. John 14 verse six, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man finds his way or comes unto the Father but by me. It's not by the Spirit. It's by Christ. And so we need to understand that Jesus Christ is saying something very bold and very restrictive here. Nobody comes to God except by Christ. Now we understand that Christ gives us his Spirit and Christ uses the ministration of the angels. But it is only through Christ that we enter into and with the Father in the heavenly courts and so i praise god that jesus christ is his son is the intercessor is the mediator is the one by whom we have access to the father because that's the end goal according to this verse right here <clears throat> the end goal is to come to the father that's really what is happening that's what god desires for us to have is access to the father and I want that. So I believe you do too. And that's our goal. That's our desire. We want to be able to come to the Father through His Son. Now, notice what it says in the 15th question. Did God send His Son into the world? And then did God send someone else after the ascension? No, we've already read that in Galatians 4, verses 4 through 6. That's why I said I was breaking some of the rules. Because I was going into that way faster than, than the notes were allowing. Number 16. 
if it was God the Spirit that placed the holy seed in the Virgin Mary, then does Christ have two fathers? No, absolutely not. God the Father and God the Spirit are not both God, uh, Christ's fathers. Notice what the Bible says that came upon Mary in Luke 1.35. It says, the, it was the power of the highest. Now remember, according to the demons, who is the highest? Jesus was the son of the highest. Now remember, consider again, 1 Corinthians 1.24. We've already read that, so I'm just going to phrase it for you. 1 Corinthians 1.24 says that Christ was made unto us power and also wisdom. So Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. You can find it for yourself, 1 Corinthians 1.24. And so noticing in number 17, when Christ was baptized and the Spirit of God came down upon him in the form of a dove, should we take that to be literal? I mean, is God the Spirit actually a bird? We're going to see Romans 1, verses 20 through 23. Romans 1, 20 through 23. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, not as the things that are made. His eter even his eternal power and divinity or Godhead, that word Godhead actually means divinity. That's the way that all three of the uses of that word are uh, ultimately also translated divinity. So that they are without excuse. So we can clearly see his eternal power and his Godhead so that we're without excuse because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto either corruptible man, which is something I'm trying to stay away from, and unto birds, which I think others should try to stay away from as well. God is not a bird. He was not in the form of a dove that came down from God out of heaven as another being that actually landed on Jesus Christ, somehow entering into him as a third God that is now filling Christ. In fact, what the Bible does teach is right here in John chapter 14, verses 10 and also 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 19. It says that the Father that dwells in me, he doeth the works. So the Father was in Christ. Now we can understand according to Paul, that was John of course, but according to Paul, it says God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And so according to the Bible, we have Jesus Christ making it clear that the Father was dwelling in him and doing the works. We also have Paul making it clear that God was in Christ. And so God the Father was in Christ. It's not God the Spirit. We must understand that. My Father was in me doing the works. It's not God the Spirit. You see, so we have to understand what the Bible is saying and what it is not saying. I'm going to go back to the question here, number 18. In Genesis 28 verses 11 through 13, which is a description of the dream or vision that Jacob had when he was, um, you know, putting his head on a rock and sleeping, it says, uh, and John chapter 1 verse 51, they both describe a ladder. And the ladder is referred to which Christ said symbolized himself. You can see that in John 1:51. What do we see as non-symbolic ascending and descending on that ladder and or on Christ in both scripture references? You can read it for yourself both times. It's referring to the angels ascending and descending. If you look carefully at Genesis 28 verses 11 through 13, you'll find that God the Father is above in heaven speaking. The ladder reaches to heaven and it reaches to the earth. And so Christ is the only mediator between heaven and earth. And Christ is allowing or enabling angels to ascend and descend. That's what's happening. God is using his son as a mediator between heaven and earth. And the son is using angels to traverse up and down upon that ladder, which is the only mediator between God and men. And what did the angels do? Well, the angels brought the message that God the Father was speaking in heaven. 
And you can see that that message was relayed to the likes of Daniel and Jacob and Joseph in the New Testament and Re uh, John the Revelator and Peter and all these people. <laughs> or Daniel or, or Revelation all through the scriptures. So the angels are a major part of working with the Father and His Son to bring us into the universe.